Okay, brothers and sisters, I'm back. I wasn't really planning to say anything else um, for a while, but the Lord has led me to Jeremiah chapter 29. So I'm just going to read a little bit of it because I think it's important in this day and age. Um, essentially, you can't casually seek after the Lord. If you are casual in your walk with Jesus, you will get taken by false doctrines. I am someone who was for a while uh, as a babe in Christ, and even recently when I really was casual about my walk, I was believing things from people who were purported ministers of the gospel, but they weren't preaching the truth. And unless you are in the word daily and cut off from worldly things and praying, you won't notice the difference and I think the only reason why I started to notice false doctrines, the subtle ones, I'm not talking about the obvious false doctrines like some of the other ones I've mentioned on my channel with a certain large religion that's really a cult, billions of followers around the world. There's a guy that wears a little white cap and a white garment that is the leader of this religion that my husband and I were delivered out of. I'm talking about evangelical false teachers. They're more subtle. They're more cunning. They sound good, but they aren't. And they're leading people astray because they're preaching a feel-good, candy-coated gospel that isn't the truth. Uh, a lot of these people, this is not judgment on mega churches at all, but a lot of them happen to be in mega churches. And they go on mainstream television programs, news programs, and they're asked very pointed questions where the answer is very clear in the Bible, and they're not giving biblical answers. They're giving a worldly answer, and I think you can figure out who some of these people are. So I want to read Jeremiah chapter 29, starting at verse 8. Um, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you neither hearken to your dreams which cause which ye cause to be dreamed for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name i have not sent them saith the lord for thus saith the lord that after 70 years be accomplished at babylon i will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place for i know the thoughts that i think toward you saith the lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when you shall, when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. I want to highlight Jeremiah 29, 13. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I just want to go quickly. I believe it's Matthew chapter 7. Excuse me. This is a big Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is Honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So I have this study Bible I like to use, and I just want to show you. There is a where it says, "Ye shall know them by their fruits." It's the seven ways to know false prophets are known: by their general conduct, by their inward state, by the kind of fruit and works produced, by the kind of fruit and doctrine taught, by professing to do and not doing the will of God, by satanic backing and by their destiny. And I think this is important because we are in the, the last days. So the apostasy, the apostasy has 
two meanings. It is the falling away and it also means the departure. So we are in the middle of the falling away. There are churches that are preaching that there are many ways to Jesus. Even though Jesus is the only way, they say, well, now there's many ways to Jesus. There are churches that are preaching that all you need to do um, is to believe on the Lord and your life is going to be full of prosperity and blessed. Not enough churches are preaching about the spiritual warfare, the spiritual battle. If you read Ephesians chapter 6, it talks that Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus and he's talking about putting on the full armor of God. This is something we have to do every single day. This is not something that we can take casually because the spiritual battle is real and it's daily. And if you aren't realizing that you're in a war every single day, then you are going to be starting behind the eight ball because you're not going to understand why you're feeling so um, beaten down or weary when you're not armored up with God's armor. This is something that we must put on. It, it doesn't say that it's optional. It says, let me go to it here. Where are we? Okay. It's chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles. Phobio. To strike with fear. To frighten. It's translated reverence only here. To be afraid. See, that's the right one. Yes. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And this is, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. And you know the rest. And it talks about the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the word and the spirit, and the feet of readiness for the gospel of peace. These are things that we must be praying over ourselves every day. We must be praying scripture over ourselves. Um, I heard someone talking today about making sure that they, if, if you're around family today, if you celebrate Easter, which I don't, um, the Lord has instructed me on that this year and has convicted me and has taught me the origins of that. So I don't, I don't condemn anyone that is celebrating that. I, I, I did up until... This year was the first year that I did it. But what I'm saying is this person said, you know, if you're around your family for Easter, make sure you just maybe mention some of these stories from the gospel. It could get awkward. And I just thought, you know, you're ill-equipping people to go into battle. It's When you are sharing the gospel with people who aren't saved, you're going to get a strong reaction in one of two ways. It's going to be a visceral, visceral angry reaction or they're going to be really willing to accept it. That has been my experience lately in witnessing to people. They are all in, they want to know more, or they get really angry. And that is a physical manifestation of the spiritual world. We can't just go into this walk casually. We have to be armored up. This is a war for souls. This is a battle. We can't be lazy about this approach. If you want and you feel led by the Spirit to preach the gospel to people and to witness to people. You need to be armed for battle with the armor of God, prepared for the response that you're gonna get. You're not gonna get a rosy response, probably most of the time, because most of the world is not saved. It is a small remnant compared to the seven billion people on this planet. And so if you don't serve God, you're serving the devil. There is no gray area, there's no in between, there's no, well, you know, they're a good person. None of us are good people. We're all wicked without the blood of Jesus. And so if you don't believe that when you start preaching the truth, the devil's going to come out of some people that you would never expect. And I speak this from experience. You need to be prepared. And so we can't be casual Christians in this late hour. I'm not saying we need to be militant. I'm not saying that we need to be angry. But we need to be prepared and ready for this battle. We can't go into this thing just, oh, well, you know, I, I might, you know, if, if I kind of talk about Jesus, maybe around them, like maybe they'll come to Jesus. No, it's, it's, he says, if you seek after him with your whole heart, you will find him. Casually mentioning Jesus around a non-believer isn't going to suddenly make them a believer. You have to be direct. The 
his word, it pierces through bone and marrow and reaches the heart and soul of every man. This is not something where you can just hope, you know, it's like if you picture a little a grocery bag blowing in the wind, like, well, maybe it'll kind of land somewhere. No, this is not a game, people. When you are witnessing to people, you got to just hit them with the truth. And you can't beat around the bush and be and be afraid. If, if you if you feel called and led to witness to people, then you got to be all in. You can't be casual. You can't be worried about their response. What does it matter how they respond in the grand scheme of eternity? Let me tell you something. When I was witnessing to my husband for years, we would have arguments all the time when I got saved because he wasn't a believer. And Jesus said his word came. He came to divide. Um, and my pastor last week was talking about this. Whenever Jesus is mentioned, you don't have just people standing around ho-hum. You have people who are really overjoyed or people that are really angry. It, it creates a, a separation. It's like the wheat from the tares. And so my husband, and he, he'll be okay with me telling this, until he got saved, this type of preaching to him and witnessing to him would make him angry. And then the day that he got saved, and I was preaching to him again, what, what the Bible says and where he was going to go if he wasn't saved. He was real upset until the second he got saved and then suddenly tears of gratitude. So who cares if they get mad now? Because I guarantee they're not going to be mad if they get saved. So stop worrying about what people are going to think. And oh, they're going to be so mad at you. So what? You preach the gospel and you planted seeds. We are not supposed to worry about the opinions of men or women. Who cares? We are supposed to be fishers of men. And if you feel led, to go fish for people. And I'm not saying you gotta preach to multitudes of people, but if you feel led to do this, put on the armor and go run into the battle and do this thing. Because this is a vapor, it's temporary, it's all about to end soon anyway. So we're running out of time, it's time to stop playing church, it's time to stop being casual with our, with our walk with Jesus. We gotta be all about him all of the time, so. I felt led to share that with you. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Go ahead and look it up. Talk to y'all soon.